Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel. As you can see by the thumbnail, we're going to speak about two Johns and uh, Jezebel. And I'm very excited. This uh, devotional teaching has been weighing heavy on my heart. And through an experience that I had this morning, Father showed me that definitely this is the one he wants me to talk about first. So I will be speaking about this. I'm going to give a, a word that Father gave me a long while back. Um, and also I'm going to talk about a dream that I had and um, just so applicable to what he's been showing me. Okay, so the first thing that I want to mention um, is that the, the call upon my life, uh, Father showed me, is that I am to, even though I've got a prophetic call upon my life, it's not so much with regards to what will happen future-wise, although he does show me things at times, um, it's more about revealing his heart. And the reason by that, uh, for that is so that I, the call is to prepare the workers for the time to come. So he reveals his heart about things, revelations about his heart, about knowing him, um, so that we can understand how he feels about things, right? It's important if we know his opinion and how he feels about things. So the first thing, you know, the first time he ever spoke to me was in... Uh, I don't know, I was 16 years old. I gave my heart to the Lord when I was 14 years old. At that time, at 16 years of age, this is the first time I heard him speak to me. And he said to me, you will seek me with all your heart and you will find me. And then he said, you will find my love and you will paint the colors of my love. Now, at that stage, I had no idea what he was talking about, just that I would find his love. And my whole sanctification process was that of seeking him with my whole heart and authenticity and those type of things and I paint I uh, love painting um, but I now know that it was with a reference not only just to painting itself but to be able to you know a picture speaks a thousand words be able to write also for him as well or to reveal his heart so I'm saying this for a specific reason because of the John's John's the two Johns that we will speak about, their specific disposition. Okay, so I watched the other day, I watched a movie, I can't remember the name, but it started off with two women that were very close friends, very, very close. I could just see the love and care for one another and just the laughter and the jokes and just absolute fun they had and it was just something beautiful to watch. And at one stage, the one lady, uh, she got cancer and she had a long time to live. And they were sitting, uh, the two friends were sitting in a, uh, what seems like a cafeteria or a shop eating something. And the one friend just mm. came behind a friend and she just held her and started mm. crying. And it touched me so deeply when I saw that because what I saw was somebody that were just so heartbroken, so heartbroken over somebody so close being taken from her. And I cried and I cried and I couldn't understand why I'm crying like this. And all of a sudden I realized that I long for a friend like that. It was such a strong desire. Now for me, this came completely from the left side because Father told me a while back, a few years ago, that I'm called to walk alone with him. And what he meant by that is that I will not be, I will not have one particular person that I can share to such a degree and be so close to that I can physically touch that person and walk with somebody in my life. I will walk alone with him. So I have friends, but I don't have somebody that close that I can, you know, quickly go drink a coffee with and finish each other's sentences and do the same things together and be that close to. Um, and I understood what that, what that means because I had a friend like that before. So it really touched me deeply when I felt this way. And I couldn't understand and I said to him, Father, please send me a friend. I actually prayed for a friend. That's how strong the longing was. Anyway, in the meanwhile, he did send a friend, but anyway... Before we go on with that, um, I then spoke to him about it and at that moment he said to me, when I asked him for a friend, he said to me, Petra, I used to have a friend like that. It was John. 
And immediately I just saw John lying with his head on Yeshua's bosom because it's a known fact that, you, that John was lying on his chest here with his head on his heart, so to speak. At that time they had very small, uh, 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 not small, tables were low and they had cushions around the tables and they would recline around the table, very relaxed. And John always sat next to Yeshua and often his head was on his chest. And they were so close that even at the Last Supper, during the Last Supper when Yeshua told them that one of them would betray him, they looked at each other and eventually ended up saying to John, ask, ask him who it is. So they knew John had Yeshua's ear. That's how close they were. And, you know, even the book of John, for me, if somebody had to ask me what is my favorite book, my favorite book is the book of John. And the reason for that is because the book of John has the high priestly prayer in chapter 17, where Yeshua is praying the high priestly prayer as the king, uh, uh, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, and he's praying over his priests. And he's talking about them being one. He says, Father, that they may be one as we are one, that they may be one with us. That, and then towards the end, he says that they may know that you love them the same way you love me. So there's this absolute oneness, this knit together, just this, this priest that he's praying for. Okay, so in the Old Testament, right, um, we find two friends. Now, the, the, the point I want to make with regards to the two Johns is that they are his friends. Right. So in the Old Testament, we have two friends mentioned of the Lord God. One is Moses and the other one's Abram. And with the account with Moses, we find where um, Aaron and Miriam were talking behind his back and were not so happy with Moses. Because now, you know, God speaks to them as well. And he's got a Moabite wife, you know, this Gentile wife. And... Um, and the Lord God addresses them and he says to them, If there's a prophet among you, I will speak to him in dreams and visions. But to Moses, I will speak face to face. And it mentions that he is a friend of God. So Moses was considered a friend of God because of his intimacy. Think of Mount um, Sinai, where he was up in the mountain and he's, he was with the Lord God in his presence. Right. So then uh, um, Abram again was considered the friend of God because of his faith, because he left everything to sojourn and to find uh, uh, wherever God was leading him by faith. And also he gave his son to be offered by faith, believing that he would even be raised from the dead. So the word, I think it's in Hebrews where it says that he was considered a friend of God. So we have these two examples in the Old Testament of two friends of God. But now in the New Testament, we've also got two friends and they are the two Johns. So I'll explain the two Johns to you. This one is John the Baptist. Now John the Baptist is called the friend of the bridegroom, or as we would call him, the best man, um, or the best friend, right? And an interesting part about John the Baptist um, is that Yeshua did not go to the high priest at that time to the temple to be um, baptized, but he went to John to be baptized. And the reason for this was, is we read it in Luke 1, verse 5. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias, of the course of Abia. And his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, I've heard somewhere that the uh, lineage is often taken from, um, from the woman, from the mother's side. But in this case, both Zechariah and uh, Elizabeth, they were both from um, the Aaron or the Levitical lineage. Um, this Abia was a descendant of Aaron. So both Zechariah and Elizabeth were Levitical priests from the Levitical priesthood lineage. Okay, so in my previous devotional, I spoke about Aaron. The first mention of oil was where Moses was given instructions how to make oil. And he had to anoint Aaron and the Levitical priests as well. Right? 
And then in the devotional, I point to Psalm 133, where it talks about where brothers dwell together. In other words, brother is friend, brotherly love. Where brothers dwell in unity, it is like the oil running down from Aaron's beard down onto the skirt of his garment. Right? So there we have the oil, we have Aaron, and we have the priesthood, because Aaron was the first priest. Okay, so John the Baptist, you can see, is from the Levitical priesthood, and he is called a friend of the bridegroom, or his best man, his best friend. Okay, John the Baptist is a type and shadow of the friend of God. Those workers during the seals period, right, will go... And they will be the Elijah company, the John the Baptist, that will call to the people and say to them to repent. You will remember I spoke about this in the Acts 2.0 devotional, where I said about those who wait in the upper room, the Holy Spirit was poured over them, and they came to the multitude waiting outside and they told them to repent. Okay, so it will start with the Elijah company, the John the Baptist, the friends of God, the Johns. So the next example that we have is the 144,000. Now for that, we have to take various scriptures and put them together to get a, a whole, the whole of the picture to understand. Now, once again, the book of John shows us this priesthood as well. Actually, it starts from chapter 14 right through to chapter 17, which is actually one conversation. There were no chapters in between. It's actually one conversation. And it starts with Philip that says, um, that asks Yeshua, show us the Father, right? Um, show us the Father. And Yeshua tells him, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Have I been so long with you? You know, he's actually irritated. <laughs> Have I been so long with you? And you still ask me this. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So that Philip there is a reference to the 144,000. I will uh, tell you now why I say that. Then in John 15, still the same conversation, he talks to them about abiding in the vine. He tells them to, to be one with him because they grafted in. He is their source. They can't produce fruit, which talks about the harvest. Uh, without him so they need to abide in his word abide in his love and do his commandments to abide in his love and then their joy will be full and then he tells them i no longer call you slaves now remember in um in uh in acts one it talks about that the spirit of god will be poured over the slaves and the bond slaves or the handmaidens these are the priests so you can go back to that devotional to listen to it so here we have the same example where yeshua says now, I no longer call you that. Now I call you friends. Okay, so that is in chapter 15. And we're going to John 17 and you hear the high priestly prayer that was spoken over his priests. Okay, so let's just read Revelation 14 where it talks about this 144,000. This is from verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Okay, so this just talks about their uh, uh, holiness, their walk before the Lord. Let's look at the word virgin. The word virgin here in the Strong's, if you go into the Strong's Concordance, it means handmaiden um, or a man. So it's, it refers both to women and man. So it's not one gender. They are virgins. They are virginal. Now, in what way are they virginal? Those who have not had committed adultery with the world. Now, the word says that um, those who love the world um, are enemies of God, and those who love God, you know, by extension, he's an enemy of this world. So they love not this world. They have not committed adultery with this world. The world, if we sin and we love the things of this world, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, and um, what's the other one? Can't remember. But if we love this this world, this world is seen as an adulterous woman. When we love this world we are then fornicating or we are adulterous in our relationship with the Lord God. So when we are virginal, we are not adulterous with this world. 
Okay, and it says here they are not defiled. It's G3435, and it means they are kept pure, right? From the farmant of sin who have not soiled themselves by fornication and adultery. Now, I mentioned Philip earlier, and I said that Philip is a type and shadow of the 144,000 um, in Revelation 14. So in Revelation 3, one of the churches is mentioned, and it's the church of Philadelphia. Now, Philadelphia means brotherly love, right? And Philadelphia points to Philip. So, um, once again, the brotherly love points to Psalm 133, to brothers that dwell in unity. So, if we go to Acts 21, we read about Philip. And it says the following, following about Philip, in verse 8 and 9. And the next day, we that were of Paul's company departed and came unto Caesarea, and we entered into the house of Philip, the evangelist, which was one of the seven and abode with him. Now, those one of the seven is prophetically is a reference to one of the seven churches that are spoken about in the book of Revelation. The evangelists are the Smyrna group, and the other evangelist group is the 144,000. So the Smyrna group and the Philadelphia church are the only two churches that did not get a negative report, right? Um, I can go into a lot of more detail, but let's not digress. So another thing that I need you to understand is verse 9. And the same man, Philip, had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. So once again, you see Philip, virginal. And the fact that um, it's pointing to the church of Philadelphia. Okay. Now, John, the revelator, who wrote the book of John, was trusted to receive such revelations of such magnitude to the end of the age that he was the friend that lasted to the end. And because of his faithfulness, because he endured, Lord God, Yeshua, appeared unto him and revealed to him the things to come. So he could be entrusted with these things. Okay? And if we look at the those who followed Yeshua, right? We get in John 6, we read about where Yeshua talks about if we don't eat his flesh and drink his blood, that we have no part in him. And then it talks right where John 6, verse 66, it talks about those who followed him turned around and no longer followed, followed him. And then he turned to his disciples and he asked them, Will you, are you also going to leave me now? So you have the followers and you have the disciples. And then you have John. Okay, so if we look in the context of followers, you, and with regards to the tabernacle, we can see the followers as a bigger crowd. Those are the priests, for example, that were... Um, this is just a type of shadow, that were outside and they had to do all the sacrifices. They were very busy. There were a lot of people. There were a lot of blood and a lot of activity. Less were allowed in the inner court. In the inner court, it's all about ministry. Outer court is all about sacrifice. Inner court is about ministry. There's the incense, the menorah, uh, 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 lampstand. There's the showbread and there's light. So it's all, it's still activity, and but it's ministry. Then you get the Holy of Holies. So the, 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 the inner court is for the disciples. The outer court is the followers. But the Holy of Holies is for the giants, right? Where there is no light but the glory of God. Think of Mount Sinai and the glory that came down. So the, there's just the mercy seat where the high priest meets the Lord God and we are a royal priesthood in Christ Jesus right so we in him the Johns from the 12 tribes that he has the breastplate upon him he goes into the mercy seat and we are in him before the father now what did Philip say Philip said father uh, Yeshua show us the father right okay so let's read what uh John said here, or Peter said in John 21, verse 23, Then went this saying abroad among the brethren. Now, this is the part where Yeshua told Peter how he was going to die. And uh, 
Peter was like, now, what about John? And Yeshua said to him, don't you worry about John. What's it to you if he stays and you die? Okay, so it says here, then went this saying abroad among the brethren that that disciple, talking about John, should not die. Yet Jesus said not unto him, he shall not die. But if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? So my question that I asked the Lord when I read this, I said to him, why is it that you chose John to tarry? Why did you choose him to stay to the end? And his answer to me was, because I know he will be faithful to the end. And that really touched me because um, I've been left by a lot of friends. A lot of people um, have turned away from me, from me, a lot of friends. And... Um, And so to find a faithful friend is something quite rare, truly faithful. And I've learned through the years, people are quite fickle, get easily offended. And so for Yeshua to tell me, I knew that he will be faithful to the end. I understood the value of it. And the word tarry that he used in uh, verse 23 is G3306. And it means to endure, not perish, survive or lost. And something I speak a lot about is endurance that's the name of the game so apart from you know this priesthood this friendship apart from brotherly love there is an intimacy that fosters trust and faithfulness now the opposite of that is the example of peter and peter in his denial of christ is a type and shadow of the backslidden church or the lukewarm church right and we find where where he was warming himself at the fire while Christ was inside being questioned in the court, we find that John was with Christ in the court. He never left his side. He was faithful. But Peter was outside warming himself and denying Christ, right? So we see the example of John's faithfulness. Another example is the, the word says, uh, Yeshua also said that even that very night when he told them that he would be betrayed, told them that they will all scatter, scatter. But John did not scatter. John followed him to the point of even standing at the foot of the cross with Mary, where Yeshua looked down to him and said to him, John, this is your mother, and mother, this is your son. So he entrusted his very mother to him. That's how much he trusted him. Think of that. We often say that we trust the Lord God. Some people don't, but we say we love, we trust him. We know we can trust him. We know he can keep his word. But the real question is, can he trust us? Can he trust you? Are you that John that lies with your head on his chest? Can he trust you with great things? Because he knows you are faithful and you will be faithful to the end. That's the priest. And, you know, this is why I had that longing in my heart, because I realized that that longing wasn't mine. It was his. And when I came and spoke to him about it, about this longing that I had, and he told me that he had a friend like that, I said to him, but I want to be your friend like that. I want to be that close to you. I want to lay with my head on your chest. I want to hear your heartbeat. I want to feel what you feel. I want to feel your pain. I want to feel your love. I want to feel your heartache. I want to feel your anger. And you know, he's allowed me to feel it. And it's unbearable. It's not, not easy. And I kind of thought to myself, well, you did ask for it. <laughs> but he knows, he knows my heart. He knows I want to share in his suffering. Not just in in everyday things, but sharing his suffering of what he feels every day. I want him to be able to tell me how he feels about something and not constantly be in a place where I want something from him, but that I can minister to him. I can I cry when he cries. I want to cry when he cries. I want to be angry when he's angry. I want to laugh when he laughs. I want to be that friend to him. Okay, so... If we look at the example of John the Baptist, right? 
we find that he's the friend of God, he's a friend of the bridegroom. An example of that is in Revelation 7. So we get almost like in the word of God, in Revelation 7 and in Revelation 14, we have two examples of types and shadows of 144,000, which are priests. Okay, so the John the Baptist, Yeshua said that John the Baptist is a, an Elijah that has come. So he refers to the Elijah company. Okay, and that's in Revelation 7. So remember that I spoke in the video Acts 2.0, I spoke about the apostles and, uh, and everybody that waited in the upper room when the Holy Spirit was poured over them. They came outside and they, the word says that they spoke to the multitude, right? And they told the multitude to repent, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So therein lies a complete difference with regards to um, the outpouring versus the receiving but the focus here is they came from the upper room, they came from up down to the multitude and told them to repent. This is exactly what John the Baptist does in John 1. He comes and he is as he is a light, but he's not the light. He's telling everybody to repent. He's telling the multitudes to repent and he's pointing to the Lamb of God, Yeshua. Okay, so let's read Revelation 7 and then you'll see exactly what I spoke about. Verse 4, and I heard the number of them which were sealed. Okay, so these 144,000 are sealed. What do we know about the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is our seal, says the Word of God. We are sealed with the Holy Spirit. Okay, and there were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Verse 9, because it mentions all the tribes now, and then it goes verse 9. After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues. Remember, all of that was spoken in Acts 2. All the tongues stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed white robes, and palms in their hands. And in the Acts 2.0, I discussed how the priests are the donkeys, through the word of God, are the donkeys of God. And we find in the uh, triumphal entry, Yeshua the king is on a donkey, on a colt. And he's riding into Jerusalem. And who awaits him? A multitude with palm branches. Right? This is the type and shadow of the seals workers with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And where they will be sealed with the Holy Spirit to speak to the multitude. Okay that will appear before Yeshua with their palm branches. Now the 144,000, right, in John 4, uh, Revelation 14, that is the Elisha company. Who followed Elijah? Elisha with a double anointing. Look at the difference between the 144,000 priests in Revelation 14, um, the friends, no longer slaves, but friends, versus Revelation 7, where it talks about a multitude and they just being sealed. Okay, Revelation 14, verse 1. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, and having his father's name written in their foreheads. What did Philip say? Um, Lord, show us the father. Okay, so they had the father's name written on their foreheads. Verse 2, and I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great sun and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps and they sung as it were a new song, song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders and no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. So no mention of a multitude, no mention of sealing but rather they have the name of the Father on their forehead and they are singing a new song that nobody else can sing. So it's a complete different group. And it says here about them, these are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithsoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Important verse is verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without 
fault before the throne of God. Remember, I said that in John 17, Yeshua is speaking the high priestly prayer over his priests. And he says, Father, that they may be one as we are one. He's talking about that close knitness, those brotherly love, that they may be one. Okay? And we find in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant chapter, speaking about Yeshua's crucifixion, we find that it says that he was dumb as a lamb before his shearers, and that he, um, that on his lips were found no guile. Here we find the 144,000, and on their lips is also no guile. And because they have no guile, that means they are innocent before God. It says they were without fault before the throne of God. Okay, guile means anything twisted, anything not authentic, anything not true in your speech, your walk, and your motives and intents of your heart. Clean, through the cookie, completely. Just pure, virginal. Okay, so my question that I asked Father was, you know, why is he showing me all of this? Why is he allowing me to experience all of this, this longing for a friend? What, what, what was he getting at? And the point he was saying, making to me is, Petra, that which you felt is not your feelings. You felt what I felt. You felt the longing for a friend that I have. I long. For my friends. I long for them to be so close to me. That they will hear my heart. Okay. Somebody I can trust. Somebody that will be faithful to the end. Somebody that I can show things to. Because I know I can trust them. Okay. So another example we have of that is David and Jonathan. Right. Which is a type and shadow of Christ. And his John's. Let's read in 2 Samuel 1 verse 26. And I think uh, uh, Jonathan died here, but you can just hear how David is mourning over him. He says, I'm distressed for thee, my brother Jonathan. Very pleasant hast thou been unto me. Thy love to me was wonderful. Passing the love of woman. So he was saying here to him that not even a woman could love me the way you love me. It also talks about that virginal disposition, right? And um, just he says that the love he had for him was pleasant to him. You know, is our love pleasant to the Lord? So the relationship between David and Jonathan, we can read in 1 Samuel 18, 1 as well. And it says, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. There you, you come in your relationship where you're so close with him that um, you feel torn and you feel overwhelmed in your love for him. That it, it's almost unbearable to, to feel so in love with him. And that is because the love of God is then poured into your heart and you love him with his love. It's not your own love. It's a sacrificial love that will give yourself for him. And that's why you then love him as you love him, your own soul. Psalm 25, one of my favorite verses, verse 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him. And he will show them his covenant. And showing him his covenant means those who fear me, those who I can trust, I will show them my covenant means I will be faithful to the covenant that I've made with them. I will show them, I will prove myself to them, that I am a true friend to them as they are to me. And it says the secret of the Lord is with them. So now what is this secret? This word secret is H5475 and it means the secret counsel. Assembly, familiar friends, intimacy with God. And it comes from the number from 3245, H3245, and it means seated close together, just like John, next to him. So after Father showed me all of this, I um, opened, I went into YouTube, I, I 
I just pressed onto the, the app and I saw immediately, I didn't even open it, and I saw the uh, the lyrics of a word that Sailor sings, I think it's Faithful Friend, and I just saw the, the lyrics and I was just, wow, Father, you didn't even have to be so faithful to talk about a faithful, to show me this song. But it, it was like just the cherry on the cake. It's just so, he's, he's faithful to to confirm his word. So these are the two uh, uh, stanzas that I just copied here because I thought the words were so beautiful as I read it after he sh just now shared everything to me about a faithful friend. It says, faithful, faithful to the end, my true and precious friend. You have been faithful, faithful, so faithful to me. And when the day is dawned, and when the race is run, I will bow down before God's only Son. And I will lift my hands in praise for all you've done. I will worship you, my faithful one. So, okay, now we are going to go over to old Jezebel and we talk a bit about her. I just want to tell you about my experience that I had. Probably about two days ago, I had an experience where I woke up the morning and uh, as I woke up, I heard the words, I hate you. And, uh, of course, I immediately recognized who that was from, and I just ignored it. And I went so on about my dad, and I thought, <clears throat> well, it's not as if I thought he would like me or love me. But that was it. And so this morning I had another experience. I, um, about 3.50, uh, not about exactly 3.50, I woke up. And I, as I woke up, I saw a vision. On this one side was a wolf's face, quite gnarly looking. And on the other side was a woman's face, and she was crying. It was literally screaming, but in agony almost. And um, I knew what Father was referring to when I saw that. And um, I fell asleep again. And uh, I don't know how long after that, I was woken up by two loud barks. Now, those two loud barks were spiritual barks. It wasn't an actual dog barking. It was like a wolf barking. And it vibrated through my whole being. I was wide awake after that. I believe those two barks are for the two giants. Okay, so um, there's a reason why I, I don't know, some of you might have noticed this painting behind me. You can see there's a wolf and a little girl. I did it not so long ago um, because I was waiting for Father's timing. I had this assignment for quite a long time to paint that. Um, but I painted it and I want to tell you about that painting um, that what happened I a while ago I saw a vision of this wolf and it was a uh, oh it was the most beautiful majestic wolf that I've ever seen the hair was blowing in the wind and it was gold rusty brown ochre beautiful colors um, it was such a beautiful wolf and the next moment I saw this little girl um, and she had a scroll in her hand, like that girl. I had a scroll in her hand with red shoes. And she was looking intently uh, on the scroll. Now, when I saw the little girl, I knew exactly what Father was referring to. Because at that moment, he was speaking to me about guilelessness and innocence and being like a child. And which all points to priesthood and virginal and faith and, and um, innocence before him. Right? Exactly what we were speaking about. The scroll speaks about the scroll of my life, which is as written upon it, mornings, lamentations and woes, um, the things that he shows me that I need to speak about. I don't speak about easy topics um, on my devotionals. It's all about martyrdom, holiness, laying down your life, bearing the cross, those kind of things that I speak about. Okay, so um, that is the scroll of my life that I'm to eat that has to become part of me so that I can speak from a place of authenticity when I speak. I have to eat that which I speak. I have to be speak from an authentic place. Now the wolf, obviously my first thought was, what the heck, why am I seeing a wolf? There's nothing good about a wolf, you know. And uh, there's nothing really good about a wolf in, the, in scripture as well. I mean, the only thing we really read about a wolf is where you hear that I think the wolf will sit next to a child or a snake or I, I don't know, one of those two. Um, so I was like, okay, there's nothing good that can possibly come from a wolf. So Father, you'll have to show me what this wolf story is about. And not long after that, my daughter and I decided, now we're going to look for something to watch um, the evening. And we, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack. And we found a, um, 
a, a, a movie called Vicky and Mystery. And immediately it caught my attention because the front page or the, you know, the, the whatever you call it, the picture of the movie itself was of this little girl and her pet wolf. And the story is about how they thought it was a dog and it's called a mystery because it was actually a wolf and how this wolf protected her and how she loved this wolf and it was her best friend, right? The type and shadow of the Holy Spirit, right? And it was her best friend looking after her. And um, so that was for me very interesting and her name is Vicky. And not long before that, Father gave me a, uh, another vision where I was wearing Nike shoes. And Nike is the goddess of victory, so he was referring to Vicky, um, to victory, uh, where I was walking over skulls, like a mountain of skulls with these shoes uh, overcome you know, by walking in peace. That is, that if you want to see that devotional, read that devotional. That is on my blog and it's called The Slain. Okay, so um, that's the one way that he confirmed this to me. So I knew what he was saying. He was saying to me that in the time that we are going, there, it is going to be a time of great deception of wolves amongst the sheep. Right? Great deception. But he, as the alpha wolf over my life, will protect me wherever I go. Now, wolves are very ravenous. They do not, they don't, they, they go for the kill. They tear the limbs. They are ravenous, right? So he was saying to me, this is how I will protect you in the time to come. So I feel very secure in him. And um, so the time that we are going to go in is the time of great deception of wolves. And he further confirmed it by one day I was listening to a teaching about something and out of the blue he said to me, look up the constellation of wolf. And I'm like, I didn't know there's a constellation of wolf. I know very little about constellations. So I looked it up and there is one and it's called, I think it's called lupus or lupu, lupus. And it is of a wolf and an innocent child with a finger in his mouth or something like that. So that's another example. Another one is a movie that I watched of the secret agent that had to watch very innocent girl and protect her and the secret agent was told that he is not like a dog that he can train but he's actually like a wolf <laughs> so all these examples father just brought along my path and um yeah i was just blessed by everything that he showed me the other thing that father also showed me that i am is joseph because of the dreams and interpretations and the thing about joseph is that when he asked his brothers to bring benjamin the youngest to egypt um, when he saw Benjamin, he absolutely loved Benjamin, loved, he broke down when he saw Benjamin, and I think he gave Benjamin more. Um, and the thing about Jacob, the, the blessing that he spoke over Jacob, uh, Benjamin is that he would be as a ravenous wolf. So that was just another example of our father was showing me, he will indeed be like a wolf over me. Glory be to God. So um, we don't always have to have ne negative connotations to, to things. We need to wait on him to reveal these things to us. So that is what that painting is about. It's about his protection over me. So going over to Jezebel, let's speak to Jezebel. An example of Jezebel would be, um, in the scripture, would be Saul, who was so envious about David to the point of wanting to kill him because he was scared that David would take his throne, right? He was envious about him. And it's an example of the type of spirit of these wolves that will be out there um, that will want to kill God's chosen ones, God's anointed ones, who will one day rule in the millennial reign as kings and priests. Remember, David became a king, and he's also a type and shadow of a priest, okay? Because he loves righteousness in Psalm 45, and he's anointed with the oil of gladness set apart. So the workers, the priests, will be hated by these souls, those in authority. But there's a specific spirit, the Jezebel spirit, that, will, that is in this time actually ruling and manipulating the world. So, and I will speak now about this spirit specifically. So we know that the workers receive a crown. And in Luke 22, we are told that they receive a city or towns according to... Uh, as their reward, that they will one day actually rule and reign over this world, okay? So, um, if you think of it, the, 
The enemy cannot be happy with this whole idea that these priests will take over his, his earth that he has ruled and manipulated and jerked for so long. He cannot be happy with the idea that uh, dust, these that were created lower than angels, are now priests of God that will rule and reign over the cities that he has worked so hard to rule and reign over. Okay, and it's a particular scripture that gave me a uh, so much joy. In fact, the anointing came over me when I started typing it, and I started to laugh, a laugh of victory when I read it. And I just thought of how much the enemy must hate this scripture. I'm going to read it to you now. Let's laugh together. Daniel 7, 27, it says, And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. I don't think the enemy likes that scripture. <laughs> oh, I loved hearing it. Okay, so the first place we read well not the first place but in revelations we read about jezebel um, in chapter 17 so let's go there from verse 3 so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness this is now john and i saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy having seven heads and ten horns and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color right a harlot, and decked with gold and precious stones and poles, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Okay, a lot of people have a connection with uh, her to being the uh, Roman Catholic Church and they go to all the colors and of course there's, there's a, a merit to that. However, Let's just deal with the spirit itself, okay? Now, first of all, we need to understand that the beast is a system. It's a system that rules this whole earth. And she rides this beast. So the one riding the beast, the beast has seven heads and ten horns. The one riding the beast is in control of the beast. You, in order to ride the beast, you are not, you, you're also one with the beast, Right? But you control it in which direction it goes. Okay. So she's in union with this beast. She is thirsty. Thirsty for the blood of the saints. She comes as an angel of light. She comes as an angel of light. And I'm going to explain this now to you. So this beast system, right, uh, is consisting of all the different government institutions. Now think of what we will take over, where the enemy is presently having control over, Jezebel having control over. She's had control over government, the medical institution, education, travel, agricultural, military, and especially the religious institutions. Probably more to it, but you get the gist of it. Governmental institutions. So she is in control of the system, of the beast system. That makes her a principality. So somebody does not have a Jezebel spirit. It just, if you say somebody has a Jezebel spirit, by implication, it means or extension that that person has the traits of Jezebel. But they don't have a principality within them. Principalities are over regions, over governmental institutions and control. It's the hierarchy, the top part of it. Then the powers, then the wickedness. Okay, so here we have, it's a principality, but she has minions under, under her, right? The minions we'll speak about now. Um... It's a murderous spirit. Okay, so hatred. It's envious, like Saul. It controls through intimidation and fear, right? Threats. It manipulates. It's a religious spirit, a spiritual pride, sexual promiscuity, she's a harlot, fornication, 
That's where all the pronouns that are so important are now on the forefront. You know, he, she, it, them, I, whatever they want to be called. All those pronouns that falls under that spirit's control. Because what it's doing, it's creating propaganda, just like Hitler did at the time, just before the uh, uh, Holocaust and the, uh, the World Wars. There's a lot of propaganda that went out first in order to breed hatred. It's the same that's happening now. Hatred is breeding, not just for the Jews, but for the Christians, those who will be seen as fundamentalists and go on certain lists. Okay, so that they can be hunted down by these wolves. Okay, and it's not uh, uh, this uh, 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 Jezebel spirit or this Jezebel trait. You don't just find it in women, you find it in men as well. Interesting part about her is that she is spoken about in Revelations 2 as well. Let me just see if I can find that here. Let me see. Oh, here it is. Revelation 2 says that they suffer Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. Right? She deceives the servants, the servants, with her doctrine. And there's a great falling away when Satan is cast down upon the earth. So she comes, it's a religious spirit that's involved here. Okay, that's in Revelation 2. So what Father showed me in the last days, what will cause um, people to, um, the backslidden church, the, the, the lukewarm church, the, the, he says that in the last days, brother will go against sister, sister against brother, uh, um, children will cast their own parents um, into, uh, before the magistrate and into jail. The, 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 those who are of the church, of the religious system, will turn against the priest, will turn against those who are wholehearted for the Lord, right? And in the last days, the reason what uh, Father showed me what will cause this to happen is fear, like with the example with Peter, he feared his life. If people won't have bread or something to eat, they will deny you because of, of fear of dying or fear of, of being cast into prison as well, whatever the case. People will deny you or betray you or persecute you because of fear. The next one is because of offense. Think of Judas. Judas, when he saw the woman at Yeshua's feet pouring out the oil, right? She's at a priest, priestly position ministering to his feet, right? The evangelist, the feet. She's ministering to him and she's full of oil and this costly oil is pouring over him. And Judas looks at this and he's like, now we could have sold that and got a lot of money. So yes, money was on his mind. But think of it with regards to how... Her reaction or what she did, what an indictment it was against him. The contrast between her pouring out her life unto Yeshua by, through this oil and Judah standing on one side and he didn't even kiss him, he didn't wash his feet. Instead, he just thought of the money. So he's taking offense and thinking this, the way you serve God is taking it a bit too far, you know. You don't have to be so radical. So they take offense by your holiness, by your wholeheartedness towards God. Okay. And then the third thing is envy with the case with Saul, who was very envious and hated the fact that God's favor was on David. So it's fear, offense, and envy. So I'm going to speak about envy. There's a few scriptures on envy. Envy is, uh, the word envy is H7068, and it means zeal and jealousy. So envy is not just normal jealousy. Envy is something that eats you up, that you that becomes murderous. This is example, Proverbs 27 verse 4. Wrath is cruel, and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before envy? Matthew 27, 18. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. Because of envy they had him killed. It's a murderous spirit, Jezebel. Acts 7, 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy. 
This is, this is Joseph's brothers, right? Of the same church. Joseph's brothers of the same family. And the patriarchs, moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. Okay. Acts 13.45 But when the Jews saw the multitudes... They were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, persecution, contradicting and blaspheming. So envy is a dangerous thing and will also be part of the reason for persecuting the saints. So we find that John the Baptist, right, the Elijah that has come, that if you remember, Jezebel persecuted Elijah, right? The, that Jezebel spirit in this time to come, that wolf, will specifically target the true prophets and servants of God. It specifically be out to kill them, okay, because of envy. And we find the example that John the Baptist, his Jezebel, was Herod's wife that asked for his head on a platter and also got it served in that way. And John was... He hated the religious system so much that when the Pharisees came, he turned to them and said to them, said to them what do I have to do with you? you? You brood of vipers. He called them snakes. Right? Okay, so he spoke out against this religious system and they didn't like it at all. They didn't keep quiet. So the anti-spirit, anti-Christ spirit that will flood this world is a murderous spirit that will stop at nothing to persecute the saints, right? Jezebel specifically has it out for the true prophets of God. And the, another thing about Jezebel showing just how much she's involved in the religious system apart from Revelation 2 is that she was responsible for introducing Baal worship to Israel. So what you find with the showdown between Elijah and the Baal prophets was that the Baal prophets, they were the ones that ate at Jezebel's table. Now think of Psalm 23 and that table that we're eating from and being anointed and our cup filled over versus those prophets those ones that belong to the enemy, that's of the religious system, that eat at, at uh, Jezebel's table, which is Baal. Now, Baal means bitterness, anger, and it's a murderous spirit. Right? So they are fed with this propaganda to come against God's anointed ones that sit at the table where their heads are anointed with oil and their cups run over, the sent ones of God. Okay. So there will be the true versus the false in the time to come. Just like there will be true, a true revival that will break out with the apostles that will be sent out, there will also be false revivals with false signs and miracles. Then there will be the true as well. In the same way, there will be true prophets and apostles. There will be false uh, uh, prophets and apostles, which are already the case as we know. Okay. I'm going to share my dream that I had with you on the 9th of August 2021 and this dream is so applicable to this particular devotional for you to to just see how Father has prepared and I did a uh, uh, interpretation of Sister Donna's uh, Servant of God channel. I did one recently called um, The Black Dog Chasing Her, and you will find the same example in this, um, a murderous spirit as well. Okay, here's the dream, and I'll give the interpretation as well. I dreamed that my daughter and I were riding on a tandem bike down in the city, and the city was in complete chaos with riots taking place all over. This is actually talking about now, the type of things we see now. We reached a T-junction where we needed to make a decision whether we go to the left or to the right. Either side looked dangerous, but I decided to turn right. As we turn right, I see in the air a Christian sister whom I respected a lot. So she's in the air, hovering there. In the fact, she is well respected by all and has her own ministry. She was hovering in the sky. However, her hair was pitch black and curly, ending in spikes. So it's like curly, not 
curly wrinkled almost and then it's these spikes I could see her crying as she said I can feel the pain now remember my vision that I had of the wolf on one side and the woman crying in pain this was what father was referring to so I see this woman a lady that I know that's a Christian lady that is well respected in ministry and people respect her she's in the sky on the air and she is in She's crying in pain, very emotional, and her hair is this black pointy stuff. Okay. Then to my right, I saw a huge black, saw huge black spiky crystals coming down from the sky and stopping right above the ground. So these massive spike crystals came down. I don't know what you call it, crystallites, or they came down. And right at the tip of these spikes were black ferocious wolves I can't remember when their eyes were red but they looked horrendous their teeth were huge and they were gnarling and they were they were just horrible sight to see these wolves right at the end of these crystals right and very much ready to devour anything and I told my daughter to not even look at them and that we were just going to pass them it was then that I saw three black Rottweilers standing in the street right opposite us, gnarling at us, foaming at the mouth, ready to attack. Once again, I told my daughter to not look at them, but that we were just going to pass them. And as we did, they turned into black mist and disappeared. Okay, so the ones coming from the sky, the other ones standing in the street. So the interpretation my daughter represents the children of God who has to ride in tandem with the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is often depicted as a woman and also as wisdom. So I represent wisdom in this dream where I am, she and I are riding on this tandem bike and she has to follow my lead. Okay. In other words, depend on the Spirit of God and not your own wisdom. Ride in tandem. The chaos speaks of the specific time in which this will take place time of great chaos where people will rise up against government. The Christian lady with the black hair in the sky represents a religious spirit. This is why she is in the sky, manipulating through emotion, but this is emotionalism is to deceive. Her black crystal spiky hair is the same as the crystals coming down from the sky with the wolves. Therefore, she represents Jezebel with her proverbial hounds of hell. In real life, this lady seems very sincere. She even has her own ministry and people respect her. However, she also represents those of the household of God under the control of a murderous spirit that will come against the children of God. Those who are meek in spirit and walking in faith and not in feelings. Short note here. Ever since this dream, Father revealed to me the envy in this lady's heart towards me and I've been praying for her. I have noticed more of these women in the same spirit increasing in my life as well. All fun and joy. The crystals coming down with the wolf speaks of the spiritual experience. Okay, Crystals are used by new ages to make them more spiritually aware and to open the third eye. The ability to see in the spirit. So there's deception involved here. It's all about a spiritual experience. In the same way, many in the church crave spiritual experiences, calling it a great awakening, when in fact it's a great deception. The wolves represent those in authority over his sheep, the hirelings, who will deceive them to follow them. The sheep who do not have discernment, they also represent that which is spiritual, in other words, murderous demons sent to deceive his children because our fight is not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and wickedness in the air. So I decided to do some research on black crystals and at the time of this dream my thoughts went to the goddess Kali back then and because I realized that she's black blue and she's a murderous spirit and all that. So today I uh, decided to just do a bit of research on black crystals and when I read up on the black crystals they are indeed linked to her. So can anyone say CERN and everything that was allowed through that door. There's some information about the goddess Kali and think about Jezebel and the blood of the saints. It's, the goddess Kali is called she who is black or she who is death in Hinduism, a goddess of time, doomsday and death or the black goddess. 
And we all hear about the doomsday clock a lot. Right. Sukoni is most often char characterized as black or blue, partially or completely naked, promiscuous and fornication, with a long lolling tongue, multiple arms, a skirt or girdle of human arms, a necklace of decapitated heads, think of John the Baptist, and a decapitated head in one of her hands. She is often portrayed standing or dancing on her husband. Think of Jezebel and her control over Ahab. Okay, manipulating and controlling. Kali laps up the blood before it can reach the ground. This is what the tongue is for. Jezebel's cup is full of the blood of the saints. Much like Jezebel, who is drunk with the blood of the saints and the beheading that will take place for those who do not take the mark of the beast. So you can see the connection Father showed me with the black, blue, crystals and Kali and Jezebel. Okay. The black Rottweilers in the street represent that which is of the earth. They did not come from above like the wolves. They are dogs. So dogs are, um, can, in the negative context, you can see them as um, hounds of hell and, you know, those kind of things. Or in the positive, you can see them as watchers, watchdog or man's best friend. So here are the dogs. They are on the earth. They are Rottweilers. They are not my friends, but they are dogs, right? They did not come from above like the wolves. It's much like um, Sister Donna's dream where she dreamed about the, the black dog chasing her and everybody thought it's friendly. So they are not like the wolves. In other words, the guard dogs, the counterfeit watchmen who watch to attack anyone who comes against their plans of this great awakening. They represent personal attacks from within the church by brothers and sisters and even within our own households. Okay. So Father is showing this at this time. He's bringing this to the forefront. He wants us to understand the times of deception, the times of wolves, the times of a murderous spirit. Be aware. I'm talking to my prophets. I'm talking to my watchmen. I'm telling you deception is increasing. I'm telling you to come up to the mountain and be there with me. Be my friend. Come to that safe place where I can protect you. Okay. So also remember that Jezebel's end was to be thrown to the dogs and it was the eunuchs who threw her out of the window to the dogs. Okay, A eunuch is one that has been cut off, right? He is not just circumcised, he's castrized so, or castrated. So he cannot produce out of himself. He completely belongs to the Lord God. He receives everything from the Lord God is his life. He's got no life in himself anymore. So these are the priests, the bond slaves, those that belong to him. They have the authority to throw her out to the window and to be fed by her own dogs or to the, her own dogs to feast on her and to kill her. Those very dogs, uh, the beasts that she have control over. Right. Okay. And... Let's go, the scripture that Father gave me with regards to, um, to this dream was Proverbs 9, where it talks about two women. And it starts in verse 1, it says, Wisdom had built her house, house, the house of God, right? She had hewn out her seven pillars, those are the seven churches. She had killed her beasts, she had mingled her wine, she had also furnished her table. Think of Psalm 23. She has sent forth her maidens, the bond slaves, the, 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 the slaves the, and the handmaidens who the Spirit of God will be poured over. She sent them out. She cried upon the highest places of the city, place of authority is the highest place. Whoso is simple, let him turn in hither. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine which I have mingled. Then in verse 13, we read of Jezebel, the foolish woman. A foolish woman is clamorous. She's just loud noise. She is simple and knoweth nothing. For she sitteth at the door of her house. Right? She's not hewing anything. She's sitting at the door of her house on a seat in high places of the city. She's also got a place of authority. For she sitteth at the door of her house on a seat in high place of the city to call passengers who go right on their way. So she's looking like a 
typical black widow spider to see who's coming past. And then she shouts to them in verse 16, who so is simple, you know, who is, who is like me, okay? Who so is simple, let him turn in hither, and as for him that wanteth understanding, she say to him. So she also wants to give wine and all those things. This is the same way um, that Jezebel is a prophetess and, and deceives many with her doctrine. Because she's calling them into her house. Okay. And she says, stolen waters are sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. So this it came cheaply. Right. You can get it quickly here by me. I can get you what you want. You don't have to go there. You can come here to this house. Right. And verse 18 says, but he knows not that the dead are there. Think of all the Kali and all the heads. And that her guests are in the depths of hell. The word says there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Luke 21, but before, verse 12. But before all these, they shall lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues, the synagogues, and into prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. Verse 16. And you shall be betrayed by parents and brethren and kinsfolk and friends and some of you shall they cause cause to be put to death okay just as joseph was betrayed by his brothers just as uh, john the baptist's head was brought on a platter verse 17 and you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake what a privilege you're doing something right when that happens I've often mentioned that um, what will be will that that which was will be again. So when we read of from uh, in Revelation from um, the Church of Ephesus to the right through the seven churches to the Church of Laodicea, when the apostolic age outpouring of the Holy Spirit will take place, we are going to start again at the Church of Ephesus, okay? And the Church of Ephesus, okay. Um, is the apostolic age, point to the apostolic age. And the church of Ephesus was known, okay, or the, 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 the town or the city, it was probably a town, Ephesus, was known for their worship of the goddess Diana. Now, another name for um, Diana um, is the queen of heaven, and aka um, Jezebel. So they... In, in, in spiritual context, it's the, it's the same thing. So they worshipped, that was the time where that kind of worship was quite high. They had a, a temple for the goddess of Diana. So note in my dream, it's a religious spirit within the church. Okay? And they, the Lord God told them they did everything right. They, they hate the Nicolaitans. They're exposing everybody else. But he tells them the one thing that they've done wrong is that they have forsaken their first love right so what are we talking about we talking about john that's a priest that's a friend of god and how much that priest loves yeshua that his head is on his his heart that first love above all things and it just shows you how important you know everything if you just take away from this the jezebel and the information you got from that and you fail to see the importance and the security there lies in being a John in this time, then you've missed the purpose of this devotional. Because it's not just to warn, but it's to show you that the only safe place is in him. There is no other safe place. There's no other safe place. And how important it is that we know how to abide in him, how to be one with him, and how important it is to seek his face, to be his friend. Okay. So I suppose the question we need to ask ourselves is how are we going to have to deal with this kind of murderous spirit that will be here doing, um, that will persecute the saints? Um, because if you look at Elijah, it was a fearful thing. Elijah, when Jezebel came against him, he ran for his life. And this is just after he had a great showdown with the Baal prophets and you know, fire was brought down, true fire. Um, but he ran for his life. 
And so there's something about a Jezebel spirit, that principality, that is a fearful thing when it comes against the prophets of God. And Elijah was no small fry. He was just a man, but he was no small fry. I mean, he could say to Ahab, uh, according to my word, it will not rain. Not according to God's word. According to my word, it will not rain. And it did not rain. That's how much authority he was given. And yet when it came to Jezebel, he ran for his life. So we need to understand that fear will be a constant thing that we will have to fight against. It will be a very real reality. Right? Um, so it's not going to be a one-time thing. Persecution will last the whole of the tribulation. So the other thing that we need to do is we need to call when uh, this type of spirit you have to do with it, you need to call out the manipulation. You cannot allow yourself to be manipulated in the name of, you know, being lovable or being uh, the least. When uh, Never do the Lord God want us to be manipulated, right? That's different to serving and loving someone that is abusive or persecuting you in that sense but never does he want us to be manipulated by people's um, tears or anger or whatever they can bring to the table um, john knew exactly when he came to this religious spirit he called it out and he called them a brood of vipers yeshua did the same he told them that their father is the devil he did it exactly. He called a spade a spade. And this, not in rudeness, but uh, um, standing your ground and calling it out and say, I see your manipulation. I see what you are doing and I'm not going to fall for it. Right? So you have to call it out. Um, you have to walk in the opposite spirit when it comes to this. Because the people that does this kind of thing that are subject to it are prone to gaslighting or prone to say so you are saying this so you are doing this so this is what you actually mean yes you said this so this must be this right so there's gaslighting involved wants to get you to act up pressurizing the whole time pushing you pushing you pushing you until you just feel like you're going to explode and it's that we need to walk in humility because she is known for her pride she will not humble herself she will not ask forgiveness. And if she asks forgiveness, don't, don't expect sincerity, right? Okay, there will be ulterior motive to the forgiveness. So you have to walk in humility in the opposite spirit, right? When it comes to anger, you have to be willing to forgive and show mercy. When it comes to envy, you have to be giving and loving and ministering to that person. Okay, so... When it comes to the manipulation, you call it out. But when it comes to all the other traits, you walk in the opposite spirit, in the fruit of the spirit, right? That's why Yeshua says, um, you can do nothing without me, for you are the branches. You cannot bear fruit without me. We have to bear the fruit by being in him, but they have to eat the fruit. The fruit is not for us. Long-suffering, mercy, kindness, goodness, love, joy, peace, uh, 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 self-control yes we live it out we need it but they eat it they eat it in order that it may bring conviction in order that it may be as coals on their head remember where peter stood at the fire that is a reference to the coals that also uh, 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 peter found yeshua at the, uh, 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 at the beach when uh, uh, Yeshua was preparing uh, fish uh, and bread and, and he told Peter, Peter, do you love me? Those coals of fire were on his head. He was showing him love when he denied him and betrayed him. Okay, so we walk in that same spirit. Where there's hate, we love our enemies. We are even willing to die for them. So there were no guile find in them, in these uh, uh, um, 144,000. No guile to be found. It doesn't make you a walk over. Anybody can walk over you and just have their way with you. But you walk in the opposite spirit, in humility, um, and you, you speak the truth in love. 
So what is it that Father wants of us in order to be able to deal with this? In order to be able to walk in the opposite spirit, you have to search your own heart whether you've got bitterness, whether you've got pride, whether you've got a religious spirit, whether you seek applause, um, whether you have unforgiveness, whether you want to, you know, feel, you know, you just wait your turn, whether you manipulate, whether you gossip or slander your brother and sister, whether you have envy in your heart, whether you have fear in your heart. You have to search your own heart and ensure that you come into that place where you can deal with it because out of the heart flows the issues of life. You can't think that you can go in this time of great deception and this kind of fear and persecution and have these issues in your heart and think that these issues in your heart will not affect you by how you deal with it because it most assuredly will. You need to seek God's face daily to deal with those issues so that when this comes to you, the enemy will find nothing in you. Yeshua said to, uh, who did he say it to? I think he said to the devil, you have nothing in me. Or he said to somebody, the devil has nothing in me. Nothing, he must find nothing in you. So that when you speak, your words have power because there's authenticity behind it. At the heart of this, he's longing for a friend that will remain faithful to the end, one that he can trust and share his heart with and his secret counsel, those who will spend actual time getting to know him, desiring to know his heart and what he feels, that will lay their head on his chest and be close to him, know what it is to be that close to him where he can just be still. Don't ever have to feel, oh, I have to do this and this and this to make my time with him count. <laughs> Sharing in his joy and his anger and his sorrow, who cannot stop serving him no matter what they have to endure. They are in, for, in it for the long haul. They will tarry to the end. I'm sharing lastly a word that he gave me on the 9th of April 2021 and it's called, I call you friends. My friends share in my sufferings. They too become the outcasts, the odd ones out, and yes, even though part of society, yet not. For the things of the spirit can only be discerned in the spirit, and those who are of the flesh cannot see or hear with the ears or the eyes of the spirit being veiled. But I alone am the great revealer. I alone open blind eyes and deaf ears. I alone can cause strongholds to fall as darkness is overcome by the light of of my countenance so that those who sit in the dark are as those who declare I have seen a light they rise anew from where they were and walk in the light of new revelations nobody but I can reveal the deeper things of the spirit for spirit speaks to spirit and so my friends having received these revelations do not walk as others do they do not talk as others do, and just like me, they are alone even in the crowd. But I will never leave them. I will never forsake them. They are in me. They are my friends, my called out ones, those who walk to my rhythm, to the beat of my heart. They suffer in me, and they do it alone. But I see all things. And I know all things, even this. Though you are alone in this world, there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I call you my friends. And my friends know what I want. Your intimacy with me disqualifies you with the world and those close to you. For you walk by the Spirit and in the Spirit. You are not of this world, but have called you by name. Have I not said that in this world you will have tribulation, and that you must know that I have already overcome this world? Therefore, walk as I walked, not in the darkness of your understanding, but in the light of the spirit of truth and revelation. The deeper things in me 
are for those who are close, my friends. Can those who are not then understand? I call you my friends and I will never leave you. Amen. The next devotional that I will be doing, um, I will be speaking about going up the mountain. <clears throat> I've had a lot of requests of people talking to me about, you know, how do I hear Lord speak? How do I um, come into His presence? How do I worship, um, prayer? You know, just how, how, how do I enter into that sweet communion with Him where I know I've been with God and He has spoken with me? So Father has prepared my heart already in advance for that devotional. So just be on the lookout for that as well. And I also will be sharing more of Sister Donna's uh, dream interpretations that because it seems to most definitely hold hands with what Father is showing me as well. So his timing is perfect. Thank you for listening to and watching this devotional. I pray that it has blessed you and that it has encouraged you to seek him more and more. As Paul said, I count all things lost for the excellency of knowing him. There is no greater thing than to know him. Bless you.